Okay, we're going to make a start. Uh, welcome, Antonio Martin, as the director of the Sustainable Place Research Institute. And it's a very welcome, uh, a great privilege to see you all here this evening in this uh, new venue. We might have a few late entrants, people not know exactly where this, this is. It's yet to become an habitual uh, location for us, but uh, it's very nice as you can see. So um, let me just say a few things. I just wanted to, before we get on to the main business, obviously just a few big practical issues. Uh, one is that we're not expecting a fire alarm, but if uh, there is any case of emergency, the fire exit is the front of the building. Um, please uh, turn off your mobile phones. That's a sort of standard thing. Um, and so we are... Um, we're very privileged and, and, and pleased to welcome uh, Professor Tim Lang, uh, Professor of uh, Food Policy at City University London, to deliver our uh, uh, annual lecture. We've been doing this for three or four years now, having international experts on various aspects of, of the work that we um, we do in the Institute and reach out to colleagues across the UK, but also uh, internationally. And this year we've taken the theme of uh, uh, food policy. Tim doesn't really need any introduction. He's very well known for his uh, for his work, long-standing work over many, many years. Um, um, and um, it's difficult to 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 to, to summarise. But I think there's two major elements of it. One is on uh, the question of food policy and uh, inputting into government <coughs> of food policy. But also as a as a mainstream academic on. Uh, food studies, uh, food policy studies. As a result of that, he set up the unique uh, uh, centre in 1994 um, um, and from 2002 in City University, the Centre for Food Policy, which is a pretty unique institution, still is in many respects, um, focusing on aspects of food policy. Um, and it's linked to environment, justice, um, and uh, sovereignty, health, and so on. I won't actually go on into all the details about that, Tim. I could go on all night. But I, I will just flag up one uh, most recent <coughs> contribution that he's been involved in, which is the international uh, work that you may have seen recently on, uh, in the published uh, Eat Lancet report on food health um, and the urgency of climate change and the embracing of this notion of planetary health. And uh, Tim's been a leader on that for a number of years, trying to link. Uh, environmental public health with, with issues to do with, uh, with food. So uh, I'll leave it at that, Tim. I'll leave you to take, take charge. The theme, uh, the, the question is short. Um, <coughs> it's not a short answer. <laughs> um, but um, I'm sure it's going to be uh, very interesting and we'll have time for uh, questions. And clearly this is very timely, not only with um, the rising agenda of uh, uh, food policy around the world, but also more particularly in, in, in this country. So, welcome to. Thank, Thank you Andy. very much indeed. I was coming and standing next to Terry to menace him to stop him, basically. <laughs> Um, but thank you very much. It's actually a great pleasure, and I'd like to say very nice things about Terry and the, the Institute here. It's actually a great privilege to uh, be connected as a visiting prof. And also, for, I've known Terry for 40 years, and uh, you know, it's been very lovely connections between a whole gang of us, basically, from a long time ago, who started asking big questions and we're a lot older and more infirm, and we're still asking even bigger questions. So I thought um, when Terry asked me would I come and do this, of course I said yes straight away, um, because genuinely I was honoured. Um, but also, as Terry knows, um, I, and, and Terry and I have been working probably more closely than we have for a long time, in the last three, four years, over uh, Brexit and the impact of Brexit. And we started doing papers before the referendum about what its implications would be for food. So here we are in a post-imperial country which was the first to choose not to feed itself in 1846. And here we are in 2019, um, 20 days from not knowing where we're gonna get 41% of our food. So I thought it would be a very timely question to ask ourselves, should the UK, produce more food, okay? 
So it, my title is actually what I'm going to talk about. I've got, come in, come in, just go around there. There are plenty of seats everywhere. Don't worry at all, be very informal. Um, I have many, many slides, okay? And I don't expect you to see them all. Um, um, but usually what I say is sort of watch the slides, but listen to me drone on, uh, because I'll give the narrative. Uh, and I always, the first slide says what it is because you can begin to fall asleep. This read, basically, I'm going to be exploring why does it matter if a country like Britain grows its own food? I think I'm asking a question, why does it matter now? Uh, does it matter because it's Brexit? I think it's not because of Brexit, can I say? Uh, we've been here before, World War One, World War Two. This isn't a war, except it is environmentally. Uh, I'm going to do some incredibly theoretical stuff about the meaning of food security, when some of you can just fall asleep gently for three minutes, five minutes, and then I'll wake you up. Uh, and I'm going to say, because of that, that is why we now have a different answer to why Britain should grow more. It's not because of some petty nationalism, it, it, nor is it a counterweight to, I think, a neo-imperialism deeply rooted in the British state. Other people can feed us, we're rich, let them feed us. I'm trying to steer a much more rational, evidence-based way through that. Um, and as Terry has kindly alluded, you know, particularly since I came back into academia 27 years ago, after 10 years in think tanks, and then before that, um, six years in, in, uh, in academia, and before that, seven years farming. So I've had a very kind of mixed career. Um, but that, oh, sorry, that, that second to bottom line, I have to just make it very clear. I'm, as Terry knows, I'm at the end of writing a Penguin special on what should Britain's food system be, Brexit or no Brexit. I'm not interested in Brexit. Well, I am interested in Brexit, because how can one not be, um, wherever you stand on it? But the point is, we've got to look five years and say, well, what should we be doing? Forget Brexit, what should we be doing? And it's a catastrophically unsustainable food system that Britain has. And I'm going to give you some evidence on that why I'm concluding that. And I'm going to flag, but not say too much, about the stuff that's at the end of my book, um, which is not out till uh, either late autumn or sometime. It will be with penguins. And I'm going to begin with this, one of my heroes of all heroes. How many of you have heard of William Beveridge? A lot of hands go up, absolutely not all hands go up. What do you think he is known for? National insurance, welfare state, forget it. He was a food economist. He was the first civil servant who created the Ministry of Food in World War I. He is actually the father of thinking about trying to get a post-imperial food thinking in Britain. It's why he's one of my heroes. He's flawed in some ways, very arrogant man. Uh, I love this photo. This is him, as he's known as the father of the welfare state. Here he is with housewives, you know. And it, when I did social policy, we used to call this, this was beverage man. The beverage vision of the national health system and the national insurance system was of a working man, working man, dependent wife, and uh, reared children. And we used to call it beverage family the beverage family. So he comes with a certain package, and that photo um, is it, symbolizes it. But he was very important. He wrote the, I think, the single best book ever on the British state and food, called Food Control in 1928. Um, uh, as the official historian, he was brought back by Oxford University Press, Clarendon Press, to produce the first history of the Ministry of Food, and it is luminously clear, it's a beautifully clear writer. Um, but why I'm putting him up now 
is because in 1936 he was brought back by the British state, by the cabinet office, and asked to review the British food system. This was a man who had saved Britain in 1916 to 1919 and was dismantled in 1919. Okay? And he was asked to come back and review. And of course, Beveridge, very arrogant man, said, uh, you know, devastating indictment, said, oh, we've got to start growing more food, we've got to do this, we've got to start a ministry of food. He went catalogue, catalogue, this, this, this. It died in firefighting in the cabinet. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. And then, of course, 1939, September, certain events happened. Actually, if Beveridge had been followed, the preparations on food would have been dramatic. Nothing had happened. And by probably one of the great bits of luck for the British state, and arguably a few more people than the British, uh, the Germans decided not they declared war on Britain, Britain declared war on Germany, uh, but they did nothing. No submarines, no attacking of food convoys, no nothing. This was when Britain imported 70% of its food, unlike today, 50%. Uh, and so in the year, uh, less than a year, suddenly the beverage plan kicked in without beverage. Beveridge had assumed he'd run it because he knew exactly what to do. He was completely marginalised due to cabinet fighting. Re really interesting example of what happens in the realities of politics. Uh, and, and of course then lots of things were done. Rationing, nutrition led. First time public health nutrition put at the centre of the state's thinking. Illegally, uh, Walton bought the entire Canadian wheat crop. Illegally. Churchill went bananas uh, uh, and had to do retrospective legal shenanigans to make it legal. Uh, why? Because Walton came in, um, uh, the, if you don't know who he was, um, he was the head of um, John Lewis, Lewis's, sorry, not John Lewis, Lewis, as in Liverpool, the department store, very smart uh, businessman. And he, uh, actually I haven't put it up, but in my book I put it in. Uh, he had a map done, where does Britain's food come from? There's this tiny island and arrows from all over the world feeding Britain. And he said, holy Moses. And he bought the Canadian wheat crop illegally in secret. And uh, the anxiety was, um, if that had been known, Germany would have walked all over Britain within about four weeks. So there, when I say, is this a beverage moment, I'm meaning kind of some of this. Okay? It's that urgent. Not war, just an ecosystems crisis and public health crisis. Okay. I'm going to answer my question, should Britain grow more food? My answer is yes. As Terry, being an astute man, said, you know, there is certain qualifications to that yes. Um, my, here are my answers. This is taken from my book. I've distilled down probably three, four, five, six years I've been thinking about this and working on this, um, and I think this is it. The first is planetary ecosystems mean everywhere has to grow better and more sustainably as appropriate. Britain is not. We're misusing and mismanaging our land badly. There are some food security realities, number two. Unlike what most of the right wing of the Tory party thinks, who thinks that Britain has an empire and the empire, okay, it's not quite an empire, but it's still got obligations and will do wonderful deals with us. Have you noticed we haven't got any? Sorry, Liechtenstein. Uh, trade deals. Um, let me just tell you without declaring some of the things in my book. Anyone here tell me how many ships Britain had in 1939 in its Royal Navy? 500, 200? 1,300 plus. How many have we got today? No, wrong, 77. 77, it's on the list, read. You're supposed to be not looking at me, you're supposed to be reading. God, it's wasted, Terry, why have you invited me here? Um, Britain is not, number three, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. UK is not food secure. We have no stocks, we have a just-in-time system, JIT, all of that has begun to be exposed by Brexit. Terry and I and colleagues have written something like 25 papers now of the food Brexit 
papers on the food research collaboration if you're interested in. You know, in any conventional terms, if someone wanted to declare war on Britain, well, not quite 1936, but it's not far off, actually. In terms of numbers of the population, it's more than 1939, let me tell you, because the population has gone from 25 to 66 million. Fourth is a point which is contentious, me saying this. Farmers will agree with me, but economists don't. We have now a trade gap in Britain of 24 billion pounds. In other words, we're importing 45, 46, I've got the figures later for you, uh, billion pounds worth of food, all the good stuff that's actually good for health. And we export meat, cheese a little bit, uh, and whiskey. And in fact, the only food commodity which is in the black, Terry, is whiskey. That is the single commodity in which Britain is import-export positive. So I think the food trade gap is an issue. It's a drain on the economy. Why, when you can grow more, have to then sell services or produce polluting cars, which are going anyway, to be able to afford to buy the food? Okay? This is a very old-style analysis of it. Fifth, the major cause of premature ill health, the major drain on the National Health Service is diet. We're distorting what we grow, how we eat. And fifthly, food is not the only by any means, but is a major indicator of massive and growing social inequalities. I'll give you figures on all of these. And I think seventh, uh, uh, the conclusion I have is that in the 21st century, what we mean by food security, who's the person who's doing a PhD on food security? Whoever, some of you. Um, my uh, argument is that food security can only mean sustainability for the 21st century. The notion of anything else is wrong. Intellectually wrong, Terry. So I'm being very hardline academically. What is a good food system? Anyone who knows Pamela Mason's in my book, came out well, a year and three quarters ago. This is from that, but actually it's not. It's taken from the Sustainable Development Commission, which I led on this. Um, what, is a, what do we mean by a good diet? What's a sustainable diet for the 21st century? It's not just environment plus health. It's many other things. It's economy. It's social values. It's, if you're talking about food, it's got to be about quality. You don't eat cardboard, you're eating what you like. So there's a quality element to it. And we have to be talking about governance. So uh, if you see these under these six big headings, we've grouped then lots of other things. So health isn't just diet-related ill health, it's safety, it's availability, it's the social elements of, of health, and so on. It's access, affordability, and so on. So this model is what in academia we call the multi-criteria approach. That we say a good diet, a good food system, isn't one which is price and environment. It's multi-criteria. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side here now, what this means is not choosing, saying social values are the most important thing on this. The point is it's all of them have to overlap and be given. And that's the difficulty, is in managing that. How to get environment alongside uh, good social and cultural resonances, and so on. What it means is all of that on the right. And in particular, given uh, some of the papers Terry and I and Eric Millstone have done on chlorinated chicken and hormone rearing beef is suddenly in the news again. Well, fourth time since we wrote our papers two years ago. Um, you know, the issue of legal duties. I think one of the problems we've got in Britain at the moment is there is no food plan, no thinking, absolutely nothing, and all it being exposed by incompetence over Brexit. And I think one of the critical things, if I drop dead, Terry, let this be put somewhere, we have to have legal duties put into food thinking in Britain. In Wales, we have a little bit of that through the Future Generations Act, but not enough specifically on food. 
going through the uh, Parliament in London at the moment is Michael Gove's Agriculture Act. It has no duties and no responsibilities. It has some fairly vague, very welcome, may I say, aspirations about land management, long overdue, but nothing about food. Michael Gove is taking the British state back to pre-1955, when the Ministry of Food number two was merged to join the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries to create the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. Gove is splitting agriculture and food and health and saying, I'm doing it only for the ecosystem. And dare I say it, some of us are deeply uh, 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 nervous about that, but more important, intellectually think he's creating the trade space to be able to just import more food. Which is why the question that we're discussing tonight is very important. What should we be doing? It's things like this. Uh, I think we've got to address food security and social responsibility. We've got to reverse the decline in UK growing. I'll give you the figures shortly. I think we've got to alter what we do with land. I'm an ex-farmer, that's why I declare that. Breeder of Welsh pedigree blacks, by the way. Uh, but we need less cattle. We've got to have less cattle. We've got to be eating less meat. We've got to dramatically change the configuration of land use. I will be talking about that. Um, we've got to uh, take a multi-dimensional approach to food security. And this is the critical one. When I was a government commissioner, sustainable development commissioner, I would come to Wales, go all over Wales saying, where's the horticulture? And we'll say, oh, well, we well, can't do that. You know, it's wet. We're only fit to do this. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. This is unacceptable. It's assumed. I go to Anglesey tomorrow. I'm wearing my walking boots because I'm going on to Anglesey next uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, Anglesey was the breadbasket for the whole of North Wales. And we say, no, 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 we can't possibly grow things. Nonsense. More horticulture, less animal culture. We're going to have to reskill work. I'll be talking about the food. Food's the biggest sector of the economy now. Four million people working. Much, much bigger. The food manufacturing sector is bigger than car manufacturing. It's the biggest manufacturing sector in Britain. And we're not dealing with it at all appropriately. And yet Britain is eating the most ultra-processed diet in Europe. I think I've put that. 50% of the British diet is processed foods which are high in salty, fatty, sugary ingredients. And then we wonder why the NHS is bankrupt. Uh, we've got to address this very thorny politics about price. We've had since 1846 a cheap food policy, basically all the 20th century, trying to judge food as being cheap. This was extremely good when wages were very, very low, but where not, they are relatively low, but they're not low and we're paying too little for food, and suddenly you get right-wing neoliberal economists bleating about the poor in whom they have no interest at all, but suddenly they're deeply concerned about the poor and they want to get the food even cheaper. What that means is even bigger ecosystems damage. We have to confront and explore that argument. And the final bottom one, um, we've got to actually have long change now. Uh, so, what's my answer to the lecture? You're going to be able to go to sleep now because the rest is giving you lots of graphs and evidence to go into more detail. My answer is yes, I think we ought to be growing more. Uh, not at all costs. Not from petty nationalism, nor from naive uh, self-sufficiency <coughs> arguments. We've got to have better land use everywhere. It's risky not to do. It's ignoring the slow decline, uh, which I think is... Uh, drawing in and tapping on this default position of a neo-colonial assumption that the world can feed us, which was a very interesting bargain done by capitalists, uh, the very interesting argument between three wings of the British state in the 1820s to the 1840s. But I think we've got to debate this. What's a good level? The deputy leader of the Labour Party in... Uh, on the fr food front bench two weeks ago said 80%. I wrote to him, I know him very well. Uh, 
I said, David, what's this? Where's this 80 percent? And he said, Well, you said it once. And I said, I've, I might have said 90 percent. The point is, well, on what basis are we doing this? I think that's a big, big issue for us to hammer out. What could Wales produce? What land use could we do to produce what? I'm not prepared to say 80%, but I do say 49, which is the latest DEFRA figure, percent of British homegrown production, is very risky when we have land and conditions where we could do things to. OK, you can go to sleep. That's the lecture. OK, now, here's the boring one. This, I think, is the most complicated slide I've ever put up. <coughs> I don't apologize this, because this is from my book. Um, when we talk about food security, people don't often understand what is meant. So this slide is basically pulling out different notions of sort of concepts which are in the terrain. Okay? You, there is a long tradition. You're all taking photos. My God. So this is the academics now. Um, it's actually quite a nice slide. I can tell you I've looked at this for many hours as I've tweaked it. I still quite like it. Um, you know, food nationalism is basically autarky. Pol Pot. I'm old enough to know... Uh, I'm Dorman as well. You're in. No, no, come in. Welcome. Go over there. Uh, autarky, Pol Pot, was going for autarky. Uh, food self-sufficiency, you know, where you can look at DEFRA figures and ONS figures, SSRs, you know, they're actually quite standard. What's the ratio? I shall put some up for you. Britain is 50 to 60%, depends which figures you. Norway is 40%. France is about 100%, actually. It imports some things, but... You know, France is fine, you can feed itself. <laughs> US is overproducing on such a massive scale, it wants to feed Britain. Okay. Food defence is the term that two of my other heroes, uh, Le Gros, Clark and Titmus, used. That is a big theme in my book, by the way. I find myself, who is not a military man, some of my family have been in the military but quite a long time back, um, uh, 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 but I find myself saying, actually, a state's responsibility is to defend food supplies. Uh, food control, is beverages, phrase, which I like a lot. Title of his 1928 book. Uh, and by that, he meant in typical beverage social policy way, as a good Oxford don who went to the east of London, top-down control. Let's get out of this what we want from it. So this is rational Fabian type thing. Food resilience is what many of us now use. The capacity of the food system to bounce back from shocks. Shocks are coming. We're already getting them. We're getting droughts. We're getting flooding. We're getting misuse of land. You have to be planning for food resilience for a system in the ecological term okay, of a capacity of a system to bounce back. Not to tip over, but to balance Food risks, measurable factors which alter the food status quo. Food capacity, my colleague David Barling and I use that quite a lot. Um, but it tends to be used. I don't use it so much these days because it tends to be used to be a sort of techno-scientific notion of, you know, how can we build the skills and build the technical capacity if we can't grow lettuces in Cardiff region and let's build factories. In fact, this building shouldn't be used for what it's being used for. We should fill it with um, LED light lettuce production plants. There's a lot of money going into that. Seriously big money going into technical fixes. And it's all basically around the notion of food capacity. Food sovereignty, a phrase I do not like at all. I usually offend people when I say that. This is a peasant movement's self-proclaimed notion, which I totally approve of and understand, but it's used loosely now in Britain, where it, I think, has very little applicability, um, but is uh, nonetheless extremely powerful and important. Food justice, a term which I think is extremely relevant. How can you have, um, you can have enough food to feed a population, but totally 
unequally distributed. So unless there is some notion of uh, um, 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 equitable distribution within that. And then food democracy phrase I uh, invented uh, a long time ago and it sort of runs, uh, which I still quite like, um, which is about the sort of the democratic processes of accountability and so on. So we're in basically, when we're asking a question that I said I would ask and try to answer Terry, should the UK feed produce more, feed itself more, we're in this terrain where this is the politics. Lots of different things can be taken in different ways from all of these concepts. So I'm not going into that here. This is, I'm doing more general. Okay, now let's, is this okay? Are you still with me? Yeah? Okay. I apologize putting this up, you cannot possibly read it, but I put it up because this is my single favorite thing the British state produces, at all, anywhere, at all. This is the British food system. It's wonderful. It's combined where the British state is so good uh, 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 when it allocates resources. This is combining knowledge from annual agricultural uh, censuses, uh, HMRC, the her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, all sorts of data is pooled and is in this one figure on page 103, page 103 in this annual production. Okay? You can't read it, but let me just gently say, can we even see this? At the top, that's us, 66 million people. At the bottom, uh, here are precisely 9,000 fisher people. 9,000 fisher people. Each of these boxes is a bit of the food system of Britain. On the right are the 46 and a quarter billion imports of food, uh, and they haven't got the, uh, the exports. I don't think so. No. Yes, it does, the top left, 22 billion. So we're about 24 and a half billion pounds deficit on food. This is the latest figures. What's interesting is that farming, we all talk about, should we produce more food? And everyone thinks we're talking about farming. Farming, I'm always saying it. That's why I tell you I was an ex -far I'm an ex-farmer. Farming doesn't matter at all, actually, in terms of the British food system. I'm not offended anyone. It's only 450,000 people out of 4 million people working on food. Catering is much more important. 1.7 million people working in catering. Um, uh, logistics, uh, not in here, but actually there are as many... As much money is made out of trucks belting up and down and moving the food about as is made by farming. Farming gets nine gross value added, 8.4 billion pounds worth out of 204, 220 billion pounds spent on food and drink in Britain. Farming gets 8.4 gross value added. If we just look at food gross value added, it's about 120 billion pounds. So farming is getting 7% of the money that you and I spend on. 7%. No wonder farming is in a mess. Uh, the British economy is always said to be a service economy. The service economy, this is 2016 to 2018, the latest figures I could find for us. Um, goods and manufacturing is in blue. Service is uh, yellow at the top. Uh, now look at, this is one of the important slides I've got for you. This is one of DEFRA's figures. This is, they don't call it self-sufficiency, but they call it UK food production to supply ratio. And this is very usefully off nearly 20 years. And you'll see that it's dropping. On that measure, it's dropping to about 61%. Elsewhere, the DEFRA says we're only 50%. Uh, just to put it in historical context, uh, this <coughs> bit on the right here, this is all from my book. Uh, so I'm giving you much too much, really. Uh, but it's important. I want your reaction. Britain was self-sufficient in the 1750s. Look at the different periods that we can calculate. Uh, it, it waves, it goes up, it goes down, you know. In other words, highly particular. It's a lovely slide, this. Take lots of photos. Keep me out of it. Lovely photo. 
Now look at where we get our food from. Actually, we get 50. This is also from DEFRA, saying 50%. It says here 61%. Uh, there it's saying 50%. So let's say, that's why I always say 50 to 60%. But we know we get 30% of our food from the European Union. We know we get another 11% from trade deals done through us as a member of the European Union on March the 29th. It stops. Get that absolutely clear. I can tell you. Here's where we get it from. And of course, Mr. Gove and Mr. Mr. Uh, what's his name? Dr. Fox. <laughs> Dr. Fox <laughs> thinks we're going to get it from the US, North America. Actually, it's 1% from North USA. That's including Canada and Central. Uh, we're an island, in case you didn't remember. Here I've been digging out. I probably know more about... Anyone know about British ports? I do. <laughs> you do? Great. Can I talk to you, can I talk to you afterwards? Um, here, uh, here's one of my maps on British ports. Actually, this is where the food comes through. No guessing. Uh, and that's what we're expecting, by the way. I'm on the Mayor of London's Resilience, Brexit, Food Planning Emergency Team, by the way. We're expecting this, and this is what's really, really causing quite a lot of concern, even in the stupid elements of Cabinet. They're beginning to realise, and you notice Mr Eustace resigned and is now today in The Guardian, has written an amazingly long, eloquent place really important is for Britain to keep really good standards. The bill that he's been in charge of through Parliament says nothing about food standards. Um, now here's the trade gap stuff. This is broken down by commodity. I've got it here by commodity. You can see there's only beverages, which is in the black, and that is because 6 billion of the 7.4 billion exports is whiskey. Every other one, every other one, it, it is astonishing. And I, just to sort of, I've put those all in red, obviously, for you, but here you can just see them, you know. Now this, I'm a public health man, I'm a social scientist, but I work a lot on public health. Fruit and veg, look, ten and a half billion pounds worth of imports of fruit and veg that the British are not eating it adequately enough of. Okay? And we export that tiny little bit. Uh, believe it or not, here we are in Wales, ex-pedigree Welsh black breeder. I've read and killed every animal known. I don't eat any of them now. But look at those imports of meat compared to exports. In fact, Britain isn't even self-sufficient in meat. Do you know that? You do now. Wales. Sorry? Wales. Uh, Wales is entirely dependent on selling lamb to France. And Wales voted to leave the European Union. That's why I declare I'm a quarter Welsh. I'm allowed to argue against myself. Okay. Now, let's, I could go on for hours about that sort of stuff. You're getting the flavour. In other words, Britain, in any conventional terms of security of supplies, is in a quite a weak position. And also now, I will talk a distorted condition. Think people. I'm a social scientist. I'm very interested in food and the biology and ecosystems, but I'm also a social scientist. From UCL's uh, Michael Marmot's team, uh, here are the calculations of the number of people living below minimum income standards in Britain. Look at the rocketing from 2008 to 2014-15. Below the minimum income standards is in green, below 75% of the minimum income standards. In other words, this is getting down. You've got 11 million of 66 million people living below 75% of the, min the agreed minimum income standards. 
That's why food becomes such a delicate thing. I'm an affluently paid professor. Well, I'm part-time now. But, you know, I don't have to think too much about the price of food. Wow, if you are on 100 pounds a week, you have to think about food. And wow are the incentives to eat as cheaply as you can and to eat as much ultra-processed food, high in calories, low in micronutrients as you can. So we're structuring it so that health inequalities work. This is the Food Standards Agency's actually very interesting study which I came across, which they barely publicized. Um, this is the one scale of 1 to 10 on food insecurity status. It's actually the food security status, but I've put in security. So uh, naught is me. Okay? Uh, in Wales, 74% of people say have absolutely no problem with food security. In England, 80%. We're richer. It's London effect. Northern Ireland, 78%. Now go to the opposite end, very low food security, 6 to 10 on these gradings, 3% Wales, 3% England, 5% Ireland. You say, well, that's not much. It is actually. 3% is 2 million people. Catastrophically low. Go to 3 to 5 and you're suddenly doubling it, more than. Go to marginal food security. In other words, that's usually popping in and out, times when it's bad. Christmas, usually January. And you suddenly got a very different picture. You've got, if you like, a casualization of when people are secure and not secure. Uh, this is only Trussell Trust data. You probably know this. You've got, every time I go to come to Cardiff, go to Liverpool, you trip over more and more people who are begging, who are sleeping out, and so on. Here are just the figures I put in, really, to show you this. 2013-14, um, when austerity politics, George Osborne's austerity politics kicking in, uh, it's gone up by 44%, I think that is, to the last, the, 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 the next annual figures will come out next month. Um, and, and you see it spread all over Britain. Emergency problems are everywhere, all over Britain. Uh, here's the uh, ONS latest figures, actually, got this from IGD because they did a very useful summary. Um, I've put this up to just show that this is a run of 2001 to today. Uh, this is ONS figures. Um, uh, the orange is spending on alcoholic drink and tobacco, and food and non-alcoholic drink is blue. So you can see 2001 to austerity, it's rising. And then it's dropping. It's got a bit better 2012 and it's down. Basically, the gradient is down. People are spending less on food in total and across different groups. It's massively different. What's driving what we eat and how we eat? I don't want to blame my brother was an advertiser, so we all have crosses to bear, as my mother used to say. Um, uh, but in my book, I've, it's very hard to get figures on food advertising. But something that says it's all about public information, they're very reluctant to let you know how much money they spend. It's something like three quarters of a billion pounds is spent every year on food advertising in Britain. Here are, of the, uh, the top 20 of the top 50 food companies in total advertising spend. Coca-Cola, by the way, spends every year more than the budget of the World Health Organization for Public Health globally every two years. You want me to repeat that? Coca-Cola, one company, spends every year, you should be, your jaw should be down here, by the way. Every year it spends uh, more money than the World Health Organization spends on health for the entire world at two years. Coca-Cola, one company, spends every year. And here's what it spends to give us good neutral, nutritional information every year. So last year, it spent, um, sorry, 2017, it spent, these are the 2018 figs, um, 16.4 million. You say, well, that's not much. Well, Public Health England spent 5 million on food and health. So one company spending more than three times 
what the public information is. The jaw should be down, Ruth. And here, most interesting, you can see these astonishing changes. Bird's eye chicken. Frozen chicken advertising, nearly six million. They increased it on the previous year. That's not just bird's eye on everything. It's bird's eye chicken. Uh, 274%. Kellogg's crunchy nut, an excuse for getting uh, sugar down you. Uh, 252% increase one year. It goes up, it goes down, but broadly it's gone up uh, from about 500 half a billion to three quarters of a billion in 12 years. Uh, there is a big argument going on that Terry alluded to about uh, what we're eating, the role of meat. We'll come on to this more. Um, I'm thinking about sustainability. I've been trying to say price is really important and what shapes what we spend advertising. Now I'm saying, what is the impact? Uh, the amount of this uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent, okay, the standard measure. If you're a high meat eater, you're doing that. If you're a vegan, you're doing that. The gradations here. This lovely piece of work by Pete Scarborough and team at Oxford. I've put it up just because there are lots of these studies now. We're very clear indeed. That sort of gradient applies. Does that mean to say everyone should stop eating meat in Wales? Hmm. Let's talk about it. We know dramatic changes are coming. You can't get this fact. Every week, Kantar World Panel uh, pays 30,000, mostly women, to report what they've bought and what is consumed in their home. It's actually the best data set. It's not public. I know people. Um, there is a very interesting shift, whoa, 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 very interesting shift that's gone on, that I put this up, that we're perplexed by. Um, 2014 to 2017, the amount of meat-free evening meals of some sort has gone from 3.8 billion to 4.2 billion ready-made foods. That's out of the 220 billion pounds. It doesn't sit at odds. It sits at odds with some other data. That something is going on. A, a shift of some sort is going on in what the Brits are eating. Now, let's get more, you know, land focus. My general assessment is that last four words. We've mostly in Britain got animals, not much horticulture, and we've got distorted ecological public health. Here's the Korean data, which I love. You can't see this, but this is the most accurate uh, land use system that we know. In Britain, we have 0.0001% of our land mass is down to vineyards. Tomorrow, as I approach Bangor, I will approach two very good vineyards. They're tiny. We are mostly pasture, 28%. 28.7%. Non-irrigated arable land, 27%. Peat bogs, I like bogs, they're very nice, 9.4%. Moors, I used to farm here. That moor there, I was on the top of that, putting sheep on every year, 2008. Natural grasslands, 5.2%. <laughs> Coniferous forest, only 5%. We're very low in wood in Britain. We're the lowest wooded country in Europe. We could and should be growing vastly more wood to sequester carbon. Airports, I love this. 0.199, uh, so that's 0.2% of land masses down to airports. Actually, more than vineyards. Well, I know which I'd rather have. Uh, but well, I, 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 salt marshes. I love salt marshes. Tomorrow I will no probably I will go to a salt marsh. Um, and so on. This is okay. Now this is complicated. So, but I raise this because we've got to be thinking. Here we are in Wales. Okay, it's going to be quite hard to do anything in Snowdonia. 
but here, 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 can we grow better? Um, the Committee on Climate Change are my new best friends. They have absolutely got everything I'm talking to you about. And later this year, a really important report is going to come out, where they now decided from this land use report last year that food was the single biggest driver of everything that's going wrong in Britain, Britain's land use. And they're going to be coming out with a report about it. So watch this space. But I've put this up because I really like it, because it's taken that complicated data, basically said, look, come on, actually what we're talking about is Britain's land, uh, uh, UK's land, is basically 26% crop, 31% grassland and rough grazing, so 48% is basically down to animals going munch, munch. Uh, Cropland, actually about two-thirds of that is feeding the animals here. Yeah. Uh, forestry, we're 13%. Cities, here we are in Cardiff. Fresh water, inland, very important, lovely for birds. Uh, other natural things. So you're getting a slightly better picture of what we've got to play with. Forgive me this one, but I put it in because it's got whales in. Um, I'm very interested, as some of you I know, Terry is but the first time Terry and I ever met at a meeting you ran in Coventry in 1981, so when is that, 37, 38 years ago, I just stopped farming, so I was beginning to do other things, and um, we, you, you were talking about farm holdings, I remember it very well, um, holding sizes, basically you don't need to look at this, but basically the bi we've got very small number of very big holdings account for the bulk of the land, look, this is 1.6 million uh, hectares of uh, 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 oh, sorry, that's the total. One, one, one million hectares of, of uh, land holdings of 100 acres, 100 hectares plus. So let's call it 230, 240 acres. When we go to Scotland, we suddenly see a very small number, 9,000 holdings, have 5 million acres. I know a man who owns 35,000 acres. So you get that sort of stuff. It's all uplands, you know. You could probably grow more in your garden, Terry. It could grow there. Uh, but there are things that can be done. So you've got an incredibly varied uh, land mass, land holdings, and so on. The average, as I put this in, forgive it's all so complicated, the average area of holdings in England are 87 hectares. In Wales, only 48. The smallest, 48, 41 is in Northern Ireland. Scotland, people like my friend, huge holdings, drag it up. So we've got very, very varied mixed of sort of less than, in, in global terms, a holding of less than two hectares is a small farm. So we've mostly got, in European terms, very big farms. Wow, have we got some very, very, very big farms. How am I doing? Half past six. So should I stop? Keep going? Tell me you can stop. I don't mind stopping whenever you want. Uh, here, crops. Let's talk about the crops. I examined this guy's PhD, Henry de Reuter, fantastic work with Pete Smith up at Aberdeen. Literally, only 15% of UK land is used for food. So of all of that, uh, one, it's 18 and three quarter hectares of land that's used for food in Britain uh, uh, for growing things ostensibly, only 15% of that is feeding me, not feeding an animal which is inefficient, and then I eat it. Um, here are the crops. Wheat is way the biggest thing. I'm interested in this, vegetables here. You know, we've only got 168,000 hectares growing what's good for our health. You're up. Here are the old, let's look where we've come from. This is Graham Willis's lovely report late last year. Uh, the, the number of holdings, this is England and Wales, 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980. Basically, look how it's got bigger, very fast. In the last 40, 50 years, you've only been able to survive by amalgamating with your neighbor. The average 
age of farming remains, farmers remains about 59, stubbornly. They go, someone buys the next door, and it goes on. That's what happened to the farm I used to farm. Very quickly, where does Britain fit? Uh, these are the Eurostat figures. This is numbers of dairy cows. You know, we've got about um, 2 million cows. Uh, we've got cattle, uh, we've got 10 million cattle altogether. So we've got one cow per six people in Britain. Uh, cheese production, we're down here. Germany and France are way up here. But actually our cheese has gone from there to there in recent years. Number of pigs, well, Germany, Spain, Denmark, we're down here and it's dropping. What are the environmental implications of all of this? Well, the greenhouse gas effects are immense. Uh, a quarter of all food emissions come from food, of which animal account for 58%, within which beef and lamb account for 50%. The methane emissions of beef are massive compared to, say, peas or poultry or eggs. I'm interested in water. Here we are in Britain, we're in Wales, we think we've got no shortage. We have actually. We are importing, do you remember that 10.5 billion pounds worth of fruit and veg we import? We're importing water from where water is stressed. If there's one reason we should be growing more of our own, it's to stop being water imperialists. Your country, you know. You, you could look at this, but this is really interesting. We're, we're bringing in, this is a fabulous study this year. Uh, came up. Suddenly we're all getting good stuff. This is James Elliott's lovely study again, of looking at where we're getting, you know, water stress in non-EU countries that export. He's got India here. India, we don't export much. Oh, yes, we do. Sorry, import much. What do we import from India? Correct. Now look at where the numbers of months which are water stressed in these countries where we're getting it. We're not water stressed so much, but we're importing it from countries which are water stressed. The United States. Interesting. What about pesticides? The State of Nature reports, which I read voluminously for researching my book. I wrote a book about pesticides 15 years ago with uh, colleagues uh, and from Pan UK as well, Pesticides Action Network. Um, what's basically happened with pesticides is we've used less, but they're more powerful. That's basically the story. <laughs> But the area treated has rocketed up. Since 1990 to 2016, the area that we spray with pesticides has gone up by 63%. Then we wonder why there are no insects and bird life has gone down by 52%. We don't live on the insects, they do. We've just basically killed them. And here's the State of Nature report. This is produced collectively by 20 NGOs, National Trust, RSPB, BTO, British Trust for Ornithology, <laughs> so on. 52% decline of farmland species and 48%, some of them have increased. But overall, UK farmland burns have declined by 54% since 1970. So some have got better. But overall, it's a catastrophic drop. That's why I put the pesticides first. Soil. The Committee on Climate Change, 84% of UK topsoil has been lost since 1850. We're not talking immediate. We've eroded it continually. But it's continuing at one to three centimetres per year. I was born in Lincoln. There's an area not far from where I was born where the soil was 20 foot deep. It's now 12 feet deep when a, a pole was put in, in the fence, uh, uh, and it's now 12 foot. So we're losing soil. 
uh, uh, one third the CPRE analysis, one third of all UK soils are degraded. The, the uh, well, we could go on. Uh, we won't. The greenhouse gas emissions, you know, this is too complicated, but basically the evidence coming out all the time that beef and sheep just pile it out compared to anything else. Importation of water, you know, in different ways. I've kind of made that point. Let's leave it. Now, what would happen if we started eating differently? This is the Eat Lancet report that Terry referred to that I've spent three years of my life when I was supposed to be semi-retired. Uh, but I don't regret it at all. Um, we basically, if we were to eat following guidelines, immediately our ecological footprint would improve. If we ate according to what we think is the ultimately most healthy diet, it would improve dramatically. Okay. I'm going to whiz through these very fast. Uh, if we were to change to meet health, we wouldn't need to increase the amount of cereals at all. We'd have to increase vegetables by 75%, fruit by 50%, nuts by 150%. Fish by 50%, and that is tricky because there ain't enough good sea. We're going to have to do it by aquaculture. Old-style Chinese. Seasoning, having it seasonal. I'm always saying in Wales, we've got the fantastic title, we export our mussels. Welsh school meals should have mussels once a week in season. I'm not joking. Why not? Uh, red meat production has to go down by 65%. Wow, is that tricky in Wales. And I won't show you this. This is all from our Lancet report. But, you know, this is saying the same thing. Same thing. Why we've got to do this is because what we modeled in our study, we were modeling what could the world, this is planetary level. If we're here at the moment, we've got to bring it down to some sort of equilibrium or else the world's ecosystems go apeshit. And then we get massive migration from the central belt of the world. You know, the politics that gave the referendum the result of anti-immigration is nothing to what is going to happen in the next week. Nothing. Uh, I'll leave that. Meanwhile, Public Health England, okay, so that you can't claim this, is saying, here's what the diet we should be eating. And it does now just say, please eat less red, red and processed meat, in little writing. But it's not translated into agriculture policy. It's not translated into food trade policy. OK, what would it look like? Um, this is what I wanted to show you. Although the Lancet Commission report was global in its perspective, we've released the country data. I can give it to you if you want. And this is the country data of what this does. If we followed the Lancet uh, diet, uh, the, what we've called the planetary diet, um, the UK diet is currently here. If you were flexitarian, it's here. Pescatarian, vegetarian, or vegan. You know, obviously, a vegan and a vegetarian, even a pescatarian, cuts out beef, pork, poultry, dairy, and eggs. But fish, pescatarian diet, which I eat, um, uh, uh, does that. So big changes occur according to your cultural preference and your dietary preference if you're going to be British and get your food from somewhere. Eat Lancet, we didn't talk about where your food comes from. We're assuming planet Earth. Uh, what does it do? It dramatically changes resource use. If you go the current UK diet, if we followed the Eat Lancet, it would reduce this is phosphorus, the, the brownie colour is phosphorus, greenhouse gas emissions are red, freshwater use, cropland use, nitrogen use, so on. Dramatically improved reductions if you follow the general dietary. Everything is pointing in the same direction. I'm not going to repeat this. Look at, it. at a worldwide level, it looks the same. When we break it down by regions, 
it looks the same. And we were staggered, by the way, to get 20 very argumentative old professors in a room for three years and agree <laughs> took a lot. Uh, I'll leave that. I'm going to end with horticulture. I really want to press this point of horticulture. We import uh, uh, by billions fruit and vegetables, and we export by millions. It's a very profitable industry. The price incentives are very high if you go into fruit and vegetables. Why aren't more people doing it? What's the infrastructure that's stopping them? We need to know that, Terry. Home production of vegetables is stubbornly, stubbornly, field I've got field vending. You know, a, a, an increase of field vegetables, actually broccoli. But this is entirely dependent upon EU migrant labour to pick it. Mostly in my home county of Lincolnshire. Under greenhouses, well, you've got a story. How come the Netherlands has this fantastic success story? I've been around huge enterprises run by 25-year-olds, mostly from Utrecht University. Uh, and we don't. The answer is we made policy decisions to abandon it. I think we've got to have policy decisions to resurrect it. I'll leave all of that. OK, so we're summing up. What should we be doing? I think we're getting a picture from the data. I've given you a little view of some of the data that I can bore for Britain on. I think we've got to have a massive investment in horticulture. We've got to rebuild training and skills. I think we need new colleges of food and farming. The colleges of agriculture that started in the 1880s, very exceptionally in the 1840s, some have died. They've been taken over by universities. We actually need to make them new colleges of food linking urban and rural. Why isn't Cardiff doing this? Cardiff could do this. We've got to pay growers more. We've got to sort out the labour issue. The labour issue I haven't even touched. What's stopping it? I think history. I think the arrogance of Britain thinking that others will feed it is one of our number one problems. We've got a price squeeze on primary production. Food has didn't even feature in the Brexit debate. This is astonishing, given the vulnerability. But it's building up now, and we've got to do that. Whatever happens ahead, we've got to carry on that. Uh, and we've got problems of British diet in terms of health, but we're getting better, actually. We're beginning to take it more seriously. Not all bad news at all. Where are we? I think we're in tricky times. In case you didn't get my message, I think it's very tricky time. The data cannot go draw any other conclusion. And let me tell you, up and down the food system, I'm really actually very heartened by how that is now agreed. I can go and talk to the head of Tesco, or the head of Aldi, or the head of, you know, you name it, and I can go and talk to small farmers. And people get it in different ways but they know something enormous is facing us. We need better food policy and politics representation in Parliament. It's weak. I think in Wales you've done great credit. Actually, Kevin and Terry and all of you gang here in Cardiff have been fantastic. Um, I think we've got to do a lot. So I've just put that up to remind you I gave my conclusion at the beginning. Now I hope I can, you can see why. I think the reasons why we've got to grow more are very clear. We mustn't allow them to be fudged. We've got to actually deal with them. They're planetary ecosystems. We haven't got an empire. Some people think we have. We haven't. Uh, we're not food secure by any measure. The food trade gap is growing and growing and is an economic drag. Diet, the major cause of hell health, dragging the NHS. Uh, major driver of social inequalities and it's unsustainable. If those aren't seven reasons why we should do something, I give up. And I don't give up as Terry. So, yes, we should be growing more, not at all costs, 
better land use everywhere. I think it is risky not to. My book is going to be about that. I think it's catastrophically risky to abandon where we get most of our food from and say we'll get it from Florida. Let me put it starkly. The UK is a rich country. We should be taking a lead on making our food system more sustainable. We do need to debate what level. Is 80% right? David Drew said, no, I'm not sure. I think high in some, lower in others. But overall, we do need to have some targets. And I've been saying to the Climate Change Committee, we need those targets. We need a committee, we need the EFRA committee to help set targets. The only committee in the British Parliament that's doing that is the Environmental Audit Committee. Its planetary health is really interesting. To it. So, but it will need, I think, the number one issue is social aspect. Social aspect. That's it. I was watching them. You weren't. They were listening, actually, still. I was still asking. No one fell asleep. Uh, thank you for an impressive lecture. Uh, my question is uh, actually like uh, whether the change can be better done from the bottom up. Uh, for instance, like uh, me moving to Cardiff, I see that uh, the market perfectly reacts to the movement of veganism. Me being vegan as uh, myself, I see like on every brown pub I get a vegan uh, menu but it's more, uh, most often avocado, avocado salad, or uh, if not, then uh, some tofu or something like that, which uh, is not uh, local specific. And uh, the, my question is like uh, making the awareness that uh, perhaps uh, you go vegan for being not only like sensitive, but also sustainable, which most of the vegans are, uh, they should actually realize that uh, eating avocado is not the sustainable thing. That's right. I mean, you've just said it. I think the, the, the one hesitation I have about putting up the slides about vegan comes out as good, good, good. What's good about having soya imported from Brazil, which is destroying the Amazon to create the soya plant? You know, there's, there are problems within veganism that we could talk about at great length and really interesting studies coming out. But broadly, the direction of travel has to be to redefine what is a good diet for the 21st century. It's got to be place-specific, almost certainly. As Terry knows, I'm increasingly drawn to the notion of bioregionalism, both in planning your sort of world, but also in thinking about diet. We're at the moment in a very messy situation where local is used in an incredibly loose way. One of the reasons I'd like targets and clarifications is because we need to have it clear. We actually should have a definition of local. 50 miles? What is it? Uh, so, good point. Next question. Thank you very much for a thought-provoking lecture. Um, about five minutes ago, you offered a challenge. Did I? Why can the Dutch grow fruit and ah, vegetables? Yeah. Well, because they've invested it. I'll give you the answer. That's oh, well, I'll give you another answer, Go too, on, then. perhaps. One is they're not bothered about taste. Dutch tomatoes are known as, and I translate, water bombs. Yeah. And the other thing is, which is not good for your greenhouse gases, is perhaps you might like to have a look at the subsidies, especially for the energy costs of all this glass work, That's right. especially in the west of the Netherlands. Yeah. That's how they can do it. Do we want to go down that pathway? Uh, uh, no, you're absolutely right, and the answer is no. I don't think we do. Um, I think that's why I th I'm placing a great emphasis on we've got to think about horticulture, not just replicating uh, the Netherlands. My point about the Netherlands, to clarify it, is just that they've taken it seriously and they've invested in something. They are reversing like mad their energy use. They've gone from high energy glasshouse use to LEDs and really just dramatic drops in their energy use. The problem is that they've, they've become so successful in their glasshouse industry that they've, they are the source other than Spain um, for um, peppers, salads, 
uh, and tomatoes. And you're absolutely right. I mean, that's why in my world, you notice the, the, the six circles we put up, we put quality. As one of the things I found, I had a conversation a long time ago with Terry uh, about this, I remember. Now, how is it that we have this notion of sustainability? Bring it into food, but don't talk about taste. It's astonishing. And yet everyone always says, well, I buy food by price and then by whether I like it by taste. Usually that means sweetness. But what we've got is a very interesting fight going on in Britain the last 30 years about educating our taste buds, actually. Europeanization has been really good for us. But you're absolutely right. I'm not deflecting from your point. You know, Dutch tomatoes are mostly utterly tasteless. I agree. I'm not saying it for that reason. Um, mostly, seasonality is one of the most critical issues. That's where you get taste. Hi, thanks for the lecture. I'm, I'm Pearl Costello. I work for Food Cardiff, which is a partnership of different organisations making the city more sustainable. I think you've touched on it a little bit, but my question was, what should Cardiff be doing on a city level to address some of the issues that you've raised? That's a very good question. We could talk for 10, 20 hours about it. I'm sure you'd like to. Um, let me give a very quick answer. I think you're actually beginning to do it in Cardiff, which is having some sort of local discourse, but also having a mechanism for doing it. You know, I think one of the most interesting, exciting and positive things, I don't know, Harry agrees, in the last 10, uh, five years, the sustainable cities movement in Britain popped up everywhere. Really good. What we haven't got, my criticism, that's not of you or it, is they're not formalised enough. You know, I'm a beverage man. You're not going to get change unless you've got institutions which have budget, power, reference, terms and conditions, legal duties and powers. Why did British cities get cleaned up, including Cardiff, in the late 19th century? It's because people like you and me in the 1850s spent 20 years campaigning and exposing adulterated food, and we got in 1865 the Food Acts. And then the forces of twilight tried to get it removed. And only in 1895 was it laid down in statute that local authorities were responsible. And that's why every market in every city had uh, public analysts inspecting the food. Now, you know, ultra-processed food is clean but it's killing us. Uh, we haven't got the statutory duties that are legitimating Cardiff to do that. And could Cardiff take a grip of Tesco? With great respect to Cardiff, I'm not sure. In other words, I don't think. We've got to have duties and powers. Uh, one of my slides, I put it in, multi-level action, multi-level duties, multi-level response. So I'm a hard public policy man here. I may seem nice, I'm not. I'm utterly ruthless. If we don't get powers and duties, forget any promises being made. Thanks. Um, yeah, it strikes me, it's very convincing. We need to do it. Uh, the how, I guess, is really, you may have answered a lot of this, but um, it's a really wicked problem, I suppose. And I recently launched um, uh, Adblock Cardiff campaign to ban corporate outdoor advertising and this is based on a campaign in Bristol yeah, yeah. in France. Fantastic. Um, and it's, you know... Sorry, my, I'm... For, I'm, my, I'm, for, I'm my, for my money, I I'm just... I'm sure it's illegal and I'm <laughs> totally disapproved. <laughs> for my money, I suppose that's where I would start is to try and uh, rein in some of the brainwashing and allow that space for individuals to start to make better choices um, as well as I guess some of the uh, the more regulated space but I guess that's what I was getting at is kind of where do you begin yeah. given the overlapping of, of Well positions? I'm going to give you a very pompous answer and then give a non-pompous answer my pompous answer is advertising is very important I pulled it out I don't want to demonise it totally I mean the advertising only works because we allow it to work Partly that's about laws and regulations, and partly um, the, the formal, you know, one of my favourite groups predecessor to you was an Australian group called Bugger Up, 
were the, the typically Australian bagger. Uh, uh, they literally went around, they were doctors, went around graffitiing all over food adverts. They were closed. Um, there's a great group at the moment going around doing things like that. Um, I think those sort of, they've got to work in concert with the other bits. That's partly why, forgive me going on, I didn't realise I'd run away with myself. I talked too long. But the, what I was trying to paint was a really important issue for you. If you're doing that, you must realise that whatever we're doing in our bit must connect with the other bits, which is why it comes down to your question. About uh, Cardiff, we've got to have, where you see where we began it in London in the 80, 1980s, it stopped, and then it began again when London got a mayor again. We've had a London food board, I'm on it, um, for now 12, 14 years. And you're beginning to see some influence from it. It still hasn't got enough powers, no powers at all. Uh, but when you get, like in Toronto, a mutual friend of Terry's of mine, Harriet Friedman, and a whole gang of people there we know, they, they started a food policy council in Toronto, borrowed from coming to visit the one I ran in London in the 1980s, which was deeply bedded in to the legal and the regulatory functions of the Greater London Council, and it was closed by Mrs. Thatcher. So, you know, we, 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 we should be now demanding, Cardiff needs to demand, and other cities in Wales, legal powers and duties from, for the organisation to be people's fora alongside sectors. You know, this politics has got to be sorted out. So I give you the example of the Lancet. Um, in the 1850s to the 1860s, for 20 years, the Lancet, medical journal, led the campaigns to get these sort of things. We've got to do the equivalent of that now. I think we are beginning to do that. So if you're doing advertising, connect it to nutrition. Do bugger-ups on the ultra-processed advertisement. You know, when do you see an ad for fruit and veg? Not much. Hi. Sorry, Tim. Um, I work in WWF and we're starting to look at the food system for exactly the reasons that you've presented, environmental impacts. Um, we did a report last year called the Triple Jeopardy, which looks yeah. at, um, sorry, the term food security, um, climate crisis and um, biodiversity loss and land use within that space. And it recommended that you look at that at regional <coughs> level, so you were talking about analysis at a bioregional level. And I'm just wondering, does that analysis and debate happen in the UK and in Wales now? Um, and that's what we're starting to look at. I think so it's is beginning. Is that evidence space there already, I, or is that something No, I think, funnily enough, I look at my fellow academic friend here. I think, well, he was a pioneer on this, really good. Um, thinking regionally, I think, has to be what we do. That's why I find myself going to maps like that Corinne data stuff that uh, uh, Prof Ray at Sheffield, I think, pulled all of that together. But it's done on the EU, hugely expensive to do. We'll lose all of that. So I think we haven't got it. I think we can do a sort of regional thinking in a fairly trivial way, which isn't thinking it through with land and facilities. Now, what does it, the old county system didn't help, but it, they emerged out of some sort of land ownership system. We need to be doing bioregional analysis. What would make sense? for Cardiff to relate with you, to relate with where it could get food from. It, Cardiff isn't going to feed itself. But what could Cardiff do to raise its feeding and lower its unsustainability for food? That goes back to the lady behind you. Institutions need that. But I think we need to... You can't do it as Cardiff. Wales as a government could. The UK government could do that. Woof Woof is being fantastic, by the way, in pushing this. It's really, I always salute it, because Duncan Williamson really championed this. Good stuff. Yeah, sorry. What, I'm um, trying to give short answers. This is very short for me, by the way. What it's my Welshness, of course. I go on forever. What productive agricultural system would you advocate to um, substitute the monocultures that we have at the moment? Wow. Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll be not trivial but serious. We've got to get biodiversity from the edge of the field into the field. I think that principle is really important. 
almost certainly now we need the pretty good evidence that eating biodiversity is good. In other words, the range, increasing the range of what we eat is part of a picture of eating better. Um, the trend that's happened over the last 50 years is basically for five crops to feed the world. And most of those five crops are used to feed animals as well that then we don't. So they're hidden. Um, we've got to be thinking beyond organics. I may be stuck, ex-organic farmer here, ex-soil association member president of the organic gardens here. So I'm saying beyond organics, it's not enough. It doesn't deal with... Permaculture is not going to feed Britain overnight. Let me be very stark. You know, gardening provides a, an estimate, the maximum estimate I've read and seen was 2% of Britain's food. We know a friend of mine, the WHO's chief nutritionist, was literally parachuted in to Sarajevo in the Yugoslavian war. Bitter. Gardening helped people keep alive because they were growing greens. They weren't feeding themselves, but they were growing the micronutrients and the greens and the diversity and the herbs. He literally went under gunfire. And because they were close enough ex-peasants, they knew about growing. We don't have that in Britain. We're a totally different culture at the moment. But we're, we're building up some of that again, which I think is really good. That's why I love the gardening organisations. Nine million gardeners in Britain. Quite a lot of people to try to influence. Uh, permaculture, I think, is great. Uh, you know, I knew Mullinson, and who started it. It's a great set of principles. I think it's very... I'd like to see a modelling of what permaculture would do for Wales. I'd love it, actually. Seriously, you know. I, th I think most, if not all of us, would agree that you've put forward a very compelling argument as to why we should improve and increase our domestic food production. But you also, during your talk, criticised right-wing politicians for perhaps not listening to those arguments. Yes. I thought it was interesting because... Not all, I should no, say. No, no, not all, no. But it was interesting because if you look at the three of the key, um, I suppose, the right word is benefits of, of adopting the policies that you're putting forward is A, it improves our sense of national defence. Yeah. Secondly, it reduces the costs in the health service. And thirdly, and this one's a little more tongue in cheek, but it provides us with less reliance on Johnny Foreigner and especially the French. All of, of those arguments being perhaps very attractive to smiling, by the way. I did smile. Bearing that in mind, why do you think they are not listening to you? What is the reason? Bearing, bearing that those three aspects are normally quite important oh, to those on very, the political spectrum. Very good question. Terry's just said it. Food's not high enough on the agenda. I think that's right. Uh, but I think it's creeping up. Look at the nervousness from the work that we've done with our friend and colleague Eric Northstern on chlorinated chicken and things. I mean, that's really... It's in focus groups, I can tell you. Focus groups about Brexit referendum, it's the one thing that comes up. It's on everyone's opinion. The second issue that comes up is now concern of people who voted out, they're not going to be able to take their pets to France on the holiday. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the second issue that comes up. So at least with food's slightly creeping up. The short answer is why I corrected you, forgive me. Not all right wing, I shouldn't have said that because it was a bit sweeping. There, do you remember my complicated slide of food control, food defence, all of those. There are people in the Tory party I could enumerate to you who are absolutely get, would agree, Zach Goldsmith would agree with 50% of what I said. I know him very well. Um, so it's not as simple as right, left. I was actually, I shouldn't have said that about right wing because actually this cuts right across. I can tell you uh, Mr. Corbyn is not particularly happy with some of the things that I've been talking about because some of the things I've been talking about have been put to him, not because of me, but through other sources, and he's put red lines through them. So, you know, this, this analysis cuts across a lot of politics. Yes. And I think we would That's both say, we would both say, 
this is if you it's and it's also beyond the greening argument can i say it cuts across all the politics cuts across liberal politics you've got to get this into macroeconomic your presentation was about macroeconomic planning for food and you've got to get it into that level it's not a sexual sexual issue just quickly uh, right uh, just uh, speaking of the agriculture for the last 50 years i do disagree with about 40 percent of what you said so disagree oh yes great what so the first thing i'd say is, is that the standard of farming in britain is so appallingly bad that we can't possibly hope to compete with the foreigners and, so, and secondly when you put up your degree of self-sufficiency the nfu would have it at 68 percent at the end if you've got a 68 percent why have you got it with 50 no they don't i can assure you because i talk with I talked with Manette Blatters, I talked with Stuart Roberts last week, I, I talked with Guy Smith, I've been yeah, on all of them. I, I, all of them. These are government's figures they don't disagree with. Oh, no, that's why I disagree with them. That's why okay. <laughs> well, well I, disagree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these are government figures from HMRC. Oh. That I actually trust the tra tax thing. Put it this way, it's the only figures we've got. Which you use? Are you using money or using calories? No, they were tonnage and value added, both. Two sets of measures. Okay, I, I wanted to ask you about what I thought was a tension between your uh, narrative about security and food security and yeah. your narrative about sustainability. And on one hand, I think the food security discourse feeds into a sort of militarization as notion of crisis. It feeds into it an idea that we in the state must have a top-down, a very um, controlled approach towards this, and that in doing so we could almost adopt a bigger my neighbor strategy. For example, we could you know, produce more of our own food, and then in so doing leave those countries whose agriculture has been turned to supplying us in very dire straits. So on one hand, we have a kind of... If it was done overnight, if it yes. Was done in, in, in an this isn't going to be way. done overnight. But I think if you speak about the language of security, there's a real danger that you will go down that um, militarized or neo-colonial or um, neo-imperialist route. On the other hand, you've got a discourse about sustainability that opens up issues not just about supply, yeah. Because food is not just about supply, it's also about culturally appropriate food, yeah, of as the OECD would tell us. Um, and it opens up issues about values, and it opens up issues about local and bottom-up participation and, and, and notions of democracy and these other things that you put on your six circles. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and issues around equality and justice. So I can't quite get, get a handle on how it is you're conceiving the problem, because this slide here to me is a wider set of considerations than what you put up initially and and what you referred to throughout about the issue of security um and i just want to i'll ask I'll, you I'll face full frankly good very thank you for that um i'll deal with the militarism and the security very up front you're absolutely right i actually think there needs to be a food defense element Put into food security thinking and if Terry had asked me would I thought that a year ago I'd have said no I now think that I now think that uh, I, I'm not wanting armed guards along food supply chains don't mean that I mean I think the, the next slide uh, I think the complications of that lot is extreme uh, and I, that's why, if you notice in my, I think my first or second slide, I said I think we've got to debate what do we want from you. So thank you for your comment. Um, but I find myself not dismissing food defence. I did completely defend, dismiss it. So, because I was thinking we were in Europe, we were in a coalition of 28 member states where we were a big player. I was slightly nervous about that, but the great thing about the European system, you'd be one vote, and Liechtenstein is also one vote. Weighted under some circumstances, but mostly not. And we've chosen to go away from that. And that's why I've been going down to, in fact, one of the things that isn't there is food imperialism, because I didn't put it on this list, didn't fit in. 
um, and food nationalism I left in. Because you're right, they, it goes that way. So I totally take your point. But I am going to turn it back and say, not that you're uh, stupid, on the contrary, I think we have to think very carefully about not making sure there is security and defense of your food supply. I think that now. I think that's dangerous. You think that's dangerous? Think okay, that's we dangerous argue about it. In a where you have that's right. I do it to be against that. I read Titmus and Legro Clark, who took my view, not your view. They were right, historically. In, a, in an ideal world, I'm with you. It's not in an ideal world, and it's a very dangerous world, and it's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse because ecosystems are pushing people in a very nasty way. And I want to protect liberal values. Right. Okay, on well, that. So it's, a very, <laughs> it's a very, very important discussion. Yeah, and if you'd said me saying this, I would have denied it a year ago. But I have come to that conclusion. Reading, it's very tricky. I totally, totally agree with you. Which is why it has to be. For me, the only thing I get a bed from is that bottom one. Processes, democratic accountability is the critical way to do it. You've been very patient. I'm sorry I went on so long in the beginning. Thank you, Tim. Obviously, again.